Hi. Nice to meet you. Hello. Hi, hi. All right. Um, thanks for coming in early. I just want to um, run you through the flow of the session. So um, at around 2, when we have enough audience in, I'll just get started and I'll do a little introduction on today's event and also on FWD Startup Studio. And then I will immediately um, invite you to take over the sh screen share and you can get started from that point onwards. Lah. Okay, sure thing. Right. So um, let's just give the audience a few more minutes to come in. I think we have around five more minutes before we officially start.
Hi everyone. Thank you so much for tuning in with us today. Um, let's just give it a few more minutes. Maybe we can start in four minutes time while um, a few of our audience come in. So we have 19 so far. All right, let's just get started. Once again, welcome everyone to our Demystifying NFTs webinar and we are really, really happy to have you tuning in with us today. Before we begin, I would like to give everyone a brief introduction on FWD Startup Studio, which is the organizer of the event today. So to give you an introduction, the Startup Studio is an initiative launched by the FWD Group and it is um, an objective of the Startup Studio is to build up the startup ecosystem in Malaysia. So FWD Startup Studio has been working with 1327 Ventures, where we have several ongoing projects, such as this webinar session that we're in right now, um, alongside our pre-accelerator program and an upcoming hackathon. And I will be going into that towards the end of the session. So I um, don't want to be taking more time than I need. So without further ado, I would like to invite and introduce all of you to our guest speaker for today, Ms. Lily Wu. Hey everyone. Hi, thank you for having me today. Um, I'm so happy to be here to talk about NFTs with all of you. Um, can I just get a show of hands, like how many of you are beginners about NFTs?
how many of you are um, pretty pretty experts at NFTs already? Okay. Can you raise your hand. <laughs> All right. Um, okay. Let me share my screen. Let me see how I can get everyone in one view as well, so I can see it. Your faces. Okay. Share screen. Sorry, one second. Yep, no worries. Yeah, it will be great if everyone, um, if it is okay on your end, turn on your cameras, maybe we can make this more very informal, chill, engaging session. Um, but if you can't, then it's, it's okay, don't worry about it. Yes, it will be great if you can turn on your cameras. I'm just trying to, Okay, great. My, can you see this? Yep. All righty. Well, um, yes, once again, thank you for having me today. My name is Lily. I'm um, the co-founder of Wild Pixies NFT. Um, it's uh, the first social DAO to invest into women-led projects in the space. Um, I'm also the co-founder of, um, I'm also the startup panel lead for Stripe um, as my day job. Awesome. Mm -hmm. So um, a, a little bit about me um, was that I've always been in the startup space. I previously co-founded two um, seven-figure businesses, uh, which I exited one of them. Um, I was an uh, ex-programs at a Series A edutech startup, and now I work at Stripe. And basically what I do at Stripe is building out the startup ecosystem. Um, so working with partners like um, 137 Ventures, um, as well as other VCs, accelerators in the space to help startups. So I know NFTs have um, become a really hot topic in the last year. Um, I personally got really interested in it because um, for a period last year, I was unemployed, and um, personally, I grew up in a, with a very artistic um, family. My parents are both artists, so I started doing a lot of art um, and commissioning art, and a lot of people told me, hey, you know, you should start looking into NFTs. And so I bought my first NFT in July last year. Um, it was a cool cat, um, and then eventually I kind of um, bought, sold, and went down this rabbit hole um where i had no idea what it was about um and now i'm kind of face deep um into this space so uh you know can i get a raise of hands you know what are nfts um anyone want to have a first stab at it yep go ahead um you can drop it in the chat box or maybe if you feel a bit more courageous you can just unmute yourself and maybe Give us a little insight on what you think NFT is. Great. Non-fungible token, exactly that's what it stands for. Digital assets. Great. So, you know, um, I think a lot of people, when they look at NFTs, they think, hey, it's like a digital picture or um, it's a, you know, a yeah, photo of a, an ape or a, 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 punk, a pixelated punk, or they think it's, you know, but what is actually NFT? Um, so it does stand for non-fungible token. Well, let's kind of break that into a few parts, right? So first of all, you know, what is fungibility? What is fungible? Um, and anyone want to take a guess what fungible means in the chat? Anyone interested to answer that question? Right. Before um, we go into that question, can I just clarify, Lily, do you have a slide that you're sharing right oh. now? Oh, I'm sorry. Um, I totally thought I was sharing slides this whole time. Because <laughs> yeah, um, we're not really seeing the slides at the moment. Yeah. Oh, no. I'm so sorry. No worries. Why is this like... happening? OK. You give me two to five rupee notes and I give you 10 in return. 
standard exam. Okay, can you see this? Is it working? Oh, well, it's actually not showing yet. Um, give me one second. I'm trying to figure out why this is not sharing. Do you have, um, do you see the share screen present now button at the bottom? Yes, yes, yes. Um, okay, I have some systems preventing me from, preferences preventing me from sharing. I don't usually uh, I use see. Google Meets. Okay. So I guess that's because you're using a MacBook, I'm assuming? Yeah. I see. OK, um, don't worry about it. Maybe you can just drop the um, slides to my site, and maybe I can share that on oh, your okay. behalf. Yeah. All right, sounds good. OK. All right, slight technical issue here, but no worry we're gonna get it sorted out and then we'll get started again with the discussion on nfts okay i will share to your email Okay, shared. Okay, got it. So let me present it on your behalf and you can just tell me when you want me to go to the next slide then. Okay, great. All right, sorry for the slight hiccup. Um, let's just get on with our agenda. Okay, can okay. you see my screen? Yep, yeah. yeah. you can do the next slide. Yep, next slide. Okay, great. So we were on this page um, and Okay, I got one answer. You give me two to five rupee notes and I give you 10 in, in return. Um, yes, I wish I, it worked that way, but fungibility basically means non-interchangeable, so interchangeable, right? Um, so, you know, what are things that are interchangeable for each other? Um, the perfect example is this $1 bill. No one cares if you have a crumpled dollar bill. No one cares if you have Oh, sorry, you're not presenting it in view. Sorry, Safa. Um, so fungibility basically is anything that is interchangeable and even cryptocurrencies is kind of the first um, type of fungible kind of currencies on the blockchain. Right, you have one Bitcoin can be interchanged for another Bitcoin. Ethereum can be interchanged for another Ethereum. Um, no one really cares what um, which Bitcoin you have, as long as it can be interchanged for each other. Whilst non fungibility basically is anything that is non interchangeable. So actually, most things in this world um, is non interchangeable. If you look at you know, me as a human being, if you look at your dog, if you look at pets, look at any, most things, um, you wouldn't be able to ascribe the exact value for one thing as another. Um, and it's actually how we value most of these things in the world. So if you bought a Mona Lisa, for example, for $850 million, you'd be pretty upset if someone swapped it out for another replica uh, Mona Lisa or a different Mona Lisa, because it is. Um, there is only one of this, you know, um, drawn by Da Vinci, like that's the only one. So you'd be pretty upset if it got exchanged for something else. Likewise, if you put your dog, you know, at a dog hotel and you come back 
with another dog, you'd be pretty upset, right? So, you know, non-fungible tokens basically represent anything that is unique, of unique value on the blockchain, right? Um, and so it's this new kind of technology that allows us to represent unique items um, where it wasn't possible before and where you can actually ascribe value to it. So now you can use an NFT to represent um, the Mon Mona Lisa. You could even use NFTs to represent a person like myself, right? So ultimately what it really is, is that it's a certificate of authenticity um, that points to you know, an image or a digital asset which says, hey, you know, this is the real deal. This is the real thing. Um, and there's nothing else to it. And if you look at digital artists before, um, there was no way to track that this art belonged to the artist, right? And that's why, you know, people could just torrent all of this um, artwork. They can torrent music and you couldn't ascribe value back to the artist itself. But now you can do that with digital assets, which is awesome. Um, and so what this really does is that with the blockchain, now you can actually ascribe um, scarcity to it. It can be provable and it can be valuable. So that's fundamentally what NFTs are. Um, next slide. So um, underlying NFTs as well is actually smart contracts. Um, and with what smart contracts are is that it's basically um, follows a very simple, you know, if or when this happens, then something else happens statements. And this is written into the code um, on the blockchain. So basically it's, you know, a network of computers. It executes a uh, an, an action when any predetermined conditions have been met and verified. Um, so this could mean anything from, you know, releasing funds to appropriate parties. So in the past, you know, if you were um, having an escrow, you would rely on a bank um, after you bought a real estate property that to make sure, okay, do you have the funds? Now I will transfer the funds over. You relied on a third party. But with a smart contract, it'll basically say, hey, if these conditions are met, then this um, amount of money is automatically deployed. Right. It could mean anything from also like sending notifications, issuing a ticket. Um, and it basically removes the need of a third party to verify or execute this action. Um, and so it really enables the network to store information that is indicated in an NFT transaction. Why is this important? Because it also represents a way where now content creators can track um, who buys and sells every, and interacts with every single transaction of that NFT. So for the first time ever, you know, as a content creator, as an artist, I can put into the smart contract, hey, you know, when I first sell you this piece of artwork, I get $10. But if you sell it to somebody else, um, I get through this smart contract, I can dictate that 10% of ongoing royalties goes back to me in perpetuity, right? So if you imagine, you know, both Da Vinci, both Van Gogh, and a lot of artists um, never made it in their lifetime. They might've sold their first piece of artwork for $10, but the person that actually gains the most value is the person who resells. And that person might've sold it, you know, they might've become famous, a million dollars, might've sold it for a million dollars. You know, Da Vinci or Van Gogh actually never see that amount of money. Um, they don't get any royalties from it. And so with this smart contract, it can dictate this is how much funds go to which parties and track it on the blockchain. So that's um, ultimately a very fundamental part of NFT transactions. An example I've used here is that for my own project, for Wild Pixies, for any you know NFTs that we receive, the first one we first sold and minted our project on the blockchain, we received 100% of it, about 80% went into the DAO wallet, 90, and then 5% went into a charity wallet. We also dictated that for any ongoing transactions and royalties, um, we would receive 10% of royalties, 80% going to the DAO wallet, 5% going to charity, 15% going to the operations wallet. And that's all automatically 
um, written in. And so anyone can write their own kind of um, how they want to deploy those funds um, before they launch this kind of project. Next slide. Um, so another thing that we talk about um, uh, when it comes to NFTs, and this really is more mindful for people who want to be collecting NFTs, um, is the concept of, you know, on-chain versus off-chain NFTs. Um, does anyone want to take a guess on what it means by on-chain versus off-chain? So I think um, a lot of people don't realize, but with things like NFTs at the moment, actually most NFTs um, have off-chain digital images. What this means, what on-chain is, is basically um, an example of projects would be CryptoPunks, ArtBlocks is the first kind of on-chain art um, like curator, Nouns, on-chain monkey, they're all um, basically completely rendered, the images are completely rendered directly with code um, and they're stored in the smart contract. Basically, these images are now immortal, immutable. It's not changeable, right? And that's the real potential of what NFTs could be in terms of art, in terms of music. However, at the moment, it is extremely expensive to have images rendered in code on the blockchain, right? And so actually most um, of the NFTs are actually a piece of code that um, has an IPFS, like links to a cloud storage like AWS, where the image is stored um, in AWS, for example. So there is kind of, um, at the moment, this in-between 2.5 stage where actually most NFTs or at least digital image NFTs um, are stored on off chain on a cloud network. So it does give the ability for project owners or, or um, for artists to change the image, which is extremely not decentralized or Web3, um, but that's kind of the reality. So it's important to know the implications of what it means to have on chain, off chain. And, um, just for you know clarification and also um like my own project wow pixies we are also an off-chain nft but other than having art on on chain there are also many different benefits but it's good to know the difference next slide so how can you know nfts actually be used um and here are some kind of use cases that I I see that can potentially happen. Um, who knows anything about luxury items? Say yes, no. <laughs> the reason why luxury items like Hermes, and this is really interesting because um, I didn't really know about how Hermes, you know, created their exclusivity, um, but Basically, if you want to buy, say, this broken bag for $15,000, $30,000 at store, you can't just go into a store and purchase this bag. You need to buy, you need to have a relationship with someone in the store. You need to um, buy a lot of different other products. And maybe in three years time, they might offer you the ability to buy a bag once you've kind of um, become a long-term member. And even so, it's not guaranteed. This means that any time a Birkin is actually resold on the secondary market, it triples in value, doubles in value, triples in value. And like you see, he has an example. This Kelly bag um, is being sold, resold for $185,000. So actually, these kind of luxury items and the kind of concept is very similar to the concept of NFTs as well. It's around scarcity. Um, but it's around, you know, being part of an exclusive 
club as well and what it represents. Um, and so how NFTs can be used in multiple ways in this use case is not only just that um, it's a store of value, but it can be used as authentic um, authentication. So if you imagine, you know, this is the how they currently authenticate a Hermes bag, really, you need to go to an expert and see, hey, or go back to the store itself and say, is this actually an authentic um, Hermes bag? You can't really tell straight away. And things like physical paper authenticators um, can be easily replicated. And that's why there's so much fraud um, in this market. But imagine if you have an Hermes bag and each Hermes bag um, in the Hermes bag is, you know, sewn in a, a physical token. And when you scan the token, it goes to uh, an NFT that was issued by Hermes itself. Since it's on the blockchain, it's verified by everybody to know that this is the authentic good. And so every time you resell this bag, Hermes will know who you sold it to or when it was transacted and you have to sell the nft with the physical item to verify that it's real and now imagine that with this nft once you sell it to somebody else hermes says hey i want to take one percent of your um ongoing you know resales because previously you know they obviously hate the resale market um but now imagine if they just take one percent of every single resale that happens, um, you know, that 1% of $185,000, right? And so this is basically billions of dollars of unrealized revenue at the moment that hasn't been possible previously. Next slide. Another way that brands have been using NFTs is to segment the audience. Right, because NFT um, different projects have become an icon of specifically CryptoPunks. Um, if you own a CryptoPunk, which is one of 10,000 of these pixelated punks, then it symbolizes a certain thing, kind of like a digital tick on Instagram. If you have a blue tick, it means you are a certain type of person. And so a lot of these brands are using NFTs to also segment their audience to target you know, high profile, high net worth people, for example, which is what tends to happen when you have a crypto punk. Either you got in early or you bought this punk for you know, $500,000 or a million dollars. Likewise with um, Bored Ape, it targets a certain type of demographic. And so that's why Adidas has been doing um, a collaboration targeted towards Bored Ape holders. Um, and so Tiffany and Co recently launched their Tiffany um, necklace specifically for CryptoPunk holders, selling it for 2.5 ETH each, right? And that is actually, I think, more than that, 20 ETH each. So that's like $40,000 per, per necklace that they've sold. Next. Likewise, a lot of people are also utilizing um, their individual, you know, owning um, some projects will allow you to, and some brand like NFT brands will allow you to own the IP and commercialize um, your specific NFT that you own. And so in this particular example, um, the owner of this specific ape or mutant ape, ape, they decided to make a food brand called Bored and Hungry. And more and more kind of individual people who own one specific NFT can use and commercialize this image um, for commercial use cases and building a brand around it. Next. This is an example of um, Eva Longoria. You know, she's a celebrity but she owns one specific world of women and um, she has managed to also commercialize her specific world of women by creating a derivative of it and making merch um, to sell to other people. And so since world of women actually doesn't own the IP rights, some of the um, actual world of women staff also bought 
these merch to wear as part of to represent their own brand as well. Um, and it's something that we're also doing within our DAO. Next. This is another example. You know, I don't know if you have heard of Asian, but Asian is one of the first NFT projects um, that was, you know, launched for um, to represent, celebrate Asian culture. Um, and so what Asian did was really interesting. Um, so Matt Higgins actually bought one specific NFT for eight ETH which probably at the time um, is worth around $30,000. And so what he bought was this green jade lady, right? And so Matt Higgins bought this green jade lady for eight ETH. And so they're doing a partnership now where Asian partners with Matt Higgins, partners with, with Royal Selangor and um, to create this actual real life um, jade lady with a stand. And so by commercializing that, um, they're creating a one exclusive kind of 100 piece collection, um, selling for 2.5 ETH each or 15,000 ringgit, 5,000 Singapore dollars. And so because Matt Higgins owns the IP of the Green Jade Lady, um, he gets 40% of proceeds from any of these 100 exclusive sale from this partnership. So um, this is also different ways that people have been using IP to partner with their own project, with their own owners and other brands as well. Next. So aside from IP, um, there's also ways that you use NFTs and some people use NFTs as a membership club. Um, and so Gary Vee has done this with the Fly Fish Club. Basically, it's a physical space. It has exclusive dining experiences. And the benefit of a, um, a membership club that is an NFT versus other membership clubs is that if you don't want to be a member anymore, that it's not just paying a one-year membership fee. Um, what you're doing is that you are able to then resell it to the next person and recoup at least portion or even more than what you bought it for whilst getting all of the benefits when you needed it. Next. There's also um, NFTs that are education and skill-based NFTs, which gives you access to courses, to job portals, to accelerators. Um, an example here is the first one is Curious Addies is the octopus. And um, we, as our DAO, we bought um, a, a whole bunch of 20 ETH of Curious Addies. And basically what it gives access to is three different courses that they built with NAS Academy you know, master NFTs in seven days. They did um, uh, web development in Web3 and basically um, more Web3 courses. Plus they build out all these tools that they give access to, you know, um, portfolio trackers, et cetera, that, that by holding um, a Curious Addy NFT, they're able to get access to. Similarly with Meta Angels, they were founded by two YC founders, ex-founders, and they built Meta Angels with the first lending function in the contract. So you can actually lend out this NFT to somebody else and retrieve it whenever you want. And so by holding this NFT, you get access to kind of a Web3 accelerator called Angel Labs. Um, and so part of what Wild Pixies did is we bought a bunch of Meta Angels and we lent it out to our holders who wanted to apply for Angel Labs um, without them having to buy the NFTs in the first place. So each of these NFTs have a different use cases. Um, use case. So some might be, you know, more membership club like. Some might be education like. Some might be around building around the IP. Um, so there's lots of different ways that you can use NFTs. Next. Finally, you know, um, these are just some of these different examples and I hope it kind of sparks your imagination on what it can be used for but NFTs can also be used to redeem physical goods much like you know um, the membership club so Tiger Archives was created by Pestle and Mortar um, as a collaboration with Tiger Beer and so by issuing these NFTs basically you hold one NFT um, every month you get to basically redeem um, a dozen you know, 
beer bottles, right? Like a case of beer. And so you can go to different, so they partner with different Singapore outlets or restaurants, as well as in Malaysia, a lot of different restaurants and, and bars where you can go to that specific restaurant or go to that bar and redeem, redeem um, a tiger, a tiger beer. Or you can, you can basically um, buy a couple and then redeem a whole bunch of, of beer every single month. So um, these kind of NFTs can also redeem physical items. Next. Finally, um, there's also uh, one of the projects that I obviously am a, a great fan of, Lot of Women, which Wild Pixies is derivative of. Um, Lot of Women is one of the first projects in the space to have created um, subsequent art drops as well as um, partnerships. So by holding an NFT, you get continuous um, art drops where they basically send you um, or you can mint subsequent collections for free. So World of Women, this is an example. The first one on the left is the original um, kind of World of Women art. Um, one of their art pieces was also listed on Christie's. They've had partnerships um, with Madonna, et cetera. And so um, the second one is the next collection called World of Women Galaxy, where if you held the first one, you could have minted that one, the second one for free. Um, and then the other ones, are uh, they partner with different artists every single month. And so by holding a specific skin color, you get new artworks dropped into your wallet um, every month. And so it rewards loyal holders. Um, and you can just sell those art drops if you wanted to as well. You gotta recoup your own funds. Um, but there's so many different creative ways. Likewise, the last one is a partnership that they did with The Fabricant, um, which is a kind of Web3 fashion brand. And so by um, collaborating with them, you could mint this outfit and you can wear it in the metaverse. So um, there's a lot of different creative ways that people are, are using to create partnerships, to grow their brand, um, to reward holders with just by holding one NFT. Next. Boss Beauties has always also done a thing where they've shared royalties for different initiatives. So um, Boss Beauties is also a project that I have been an extremely big fan of. Um, they recently said, hey, we're going to um, release a book and we're going to publish a book. And so if you hold, they held a competition where you could um, write a story about the Boss Beauty that you hold. And if your specific boss beauty gets chosen, they will share royalties from that book with you. Um, that's a way that you can reward holders through um, different partnerships of and monetary kind of initiatives. Um, so in our case for Wild Pixies, we because we also hold boss beauties, we lend out our boss beauties to our holders to write stories about. And if their story gets chosen, then we would split um, the royalties with the person who wrote it and the DAO. Um, and so that's how we benefit people who don't actually hold Boss Beauties themselves. Next. So um, I wanted to share a little bit about, you know, I, I've shared a little bit about how, you know, people are using different ways to use NFTs. Um, and I wanted to share like why I decided to start Wild Pixies. So, you know, last year, as I was buying um, more and more NFTs, what I realized was that I tended to, to gravitate towards buying women-led projects in the space. Um, and so I really resonated with the mission that these women were trying to create, these found, women founders, um, and what they were trying to build. And, you know, previously as an ex-founder, you know, and now at Stripe, where I work with so many VCs and accelerators, something is pretty evident and it's the fact that um, only a very small amount of VC money actually go to women. And so, you know, statistically that's less than 2%. That means 98% or more of money actually go to men at the moment, right? And so um, with this kind of gatekeeping, with the lack of resources, maybe this kind of inequality as well, um, I really saw NFTs as a potential to help people fundraise um, a big amount of money, you know, without the need for um, fundraising through traditional means. And so, 
Next slide. How we did that um, was, you know, I brought together a team. My co-founders, Lawrence and Mark, were both actually World of Women mentors um, who I met through being part of the World of Women community. Um, our advisors include Debbie Soon, who um, used to work at One Championship as a VP, Randy Zuckerberg, who is Mark Zuckerberg's sister, um, and grew a lot of meta. Um, and we have amazing artists in residence as well. And so what we really wanted to do was to create a space um, to help and invest into women-led projects, um, or women-led NFT brands in Web3. Next. So the reason why we used NFTs is that actually this is a first time where you're able to kind of um, bypass the need to raise VC money by crowdfunding straight from your consumers. And your consumers feel like they have a, a piece of ownership over your um, project or your brand. And so really as a consumer, I with my $300, few hundred dollars, or you know, now with Ethereum or being so low, um, you can put any amount of money and choose to put money where, where you personally value as well. And so um, that's why Wow Pixies was created. Next. So what we did was that we ended up raising $2 million in four days. Um, and so how we did that was our collection was 5,555 NFTs. Each NFT is sold for 0 0.06 ETH. Um, and that was launched in January when Ethereum was worth $4,000 each. And so um, we minted that amount, which is around $1.2, $1.3 million. And then we also um, generated over 800 um, ETH in secondary transactions. So as I talked about before, in the smart contract, 80% of our proceeds actually, you know, didn't go to the team, but it went in straight into our DAO fund. Um, and that fund is used to support women and diversity led brands. Um, we were number one trending on OpenSea during Mint and we were featured on Forbes, Atlantic, um, and I was invited to speak at the United Nations as well. Next. So how did we actually use NFTs to operate a decentralized organization? Actually, most organizations, you know, these days um, are, are centralized, right? You have the CEO, the C-suite, the founders, um, they make all of the decision and all of the power is held at the top um, and everyone else kind of um, listens. A decentralized organization is basically where you share your power to your um, to the rest of the organization, but not only that. I guess with the this kind of Web three format, you're sharing that power with your consumers as well, right? And so um, we've managed to use like NFTs as a technology to create a more um, decentralized organization where this power is um, shared by everything, and we can collaborate together with our holders um, and Next slide. How we do that is actually, you know, one pixie or one NFT actually represents as a governance token as well. And so if you hold 20 pixies, you get 20 voting rights. If you have 50 pixies, you have 50 voting rights. And so um, this way, everybody gets a um, point of view. And so, for example, here's an example. We said, hey, for Boss Beauties, we want to, um, you know, we want to um, buy into this project. We've already kind of received everybody's proposal. We've narrowed it down. Boss Beauties, how much should we actually allocate? Do we want to allocate 5 ETH, 10 ETH, 20 ETH? Yes or no? And so uh, overwhelming majority said yes to allocating 20 ETH to Boss Beauties. So um, that's how we use the NFTs itself to um, generate saying power as well. Next. Another way that we use NFTs um, as a technology to decentralize power is that how we control our wallet, our DAO wallet. 
So typically, you know, you, you can access your own wallet, you can buy and sell, you can make that decision. However, um, also as added protection and security, our DAO wallet is, um, you know, managed by the three co-founders, but also three other community members, which were voted in by the DAO. And so people could put in their name, they were doxxed, um, and three people were voted in. And so you need at least four out of six signatures to make any transaction. That means that at least, even with the three co-founders, at least one person from the community has to sign off on that transaction before anything goes through. Um, and so this way, it guarantees that, you know, we have added security, but also added transparency on what each transaction is used for. Um, another way that we use NFTs is we token gate by using each NFT's metadata. And so um, what that means is that not every NFT has the same rights. Um, and actually some NFTs are more valuable than others in a tangible way. So in this example, um, how we actually structure our DAO is that any, NF any, any holder can put in proposals and say, hey, I want let's invest into this, let's invest into that, let's, let's buy into this, that. Um, we then narrow it down using a curator club. So this curator club is only 10 NFTs. They all have this kind of rainbow, this kind of swirly purple hair. Um, and so if you own this NFT, basically um, you can help narrow down the proposals that the community puts down. And so that's part of our voting process. And so as you can see here, some NFTs that in this category have been bought for eight ETH, five ETH, um, which at the time is, you know, $30,000, um, $20,000. And so it's this kind of scarcity or this kind of um, use case that you can actually create different, even different scarcity within this project alone as well. Next. Another club that we own is um, called Blue, is a trait, the metadata of the trait called Blue Bubblegum, um, where it's the charity club. So this, if you own a, a wild pixie with a blue bubblegum, then it means that you can also um, dictate which charities that we can donate to every month using that 5% of ongoing royalties as well. And so these were also sold for a very much higher amount than our kind of floor pixies. How we actually, um, as a DAO, one of the first things that we bought using our collective money that we pulled together was this World of Women royalty NFT. Um, and so not a lot of people know about this, but um, World of Women actually has in their collection separately, they have 19 of these specific NFTs that split 2% of monthly royalties to 19 holders. And the specific metadata trait is the gold earrings and the gold necklace. So everyone else doesn't get any royalties. It's only these 19 holders. And so we bought this um, NFT for 135 ETH, which is a lot of money. Um, but if you think about it, the first month back, we get royalties for the next 12 months. The first month back, they already gave us 23 ETH from transactions. So in six months, we would have made back the amount that we bought for, and we would have six months of pure profit, and then we can still sell the NFT at the end. So um, this, we bought this NFT so that we could tie our project directly with the success of of a much larger project like World of Women, which is um, the largest women-led project and one of the largest um, in general NFT brands um, in the space. And so with the DAO, we also um, bought into a lot of other women-led projects and each project has a different utility that we give access to, to our holders. So part of being a wild pixie is that because we hold all of these different um, NFTs in our wallet and each NFT represents or has different use cases, um, we're able to then give away those utility, those community benefits to Pixie holders as well. 
So by us buying, like I had the example before, 40 different Curious Addies, the Octopus, which has all these educational resources and content, we can give that away to all our health holders. By Boss Beauties, we can enter all of their competitions um, and potentially share royalties with our holders, right? With Meta Angels, um, we can, they can access, we can lend out the NFT, they can access the Web3 Accelerator or join the Adobe collaboration that they have. Um, so there's so many different ways that we both support the founders of these projects, but also give benefit back to our holders as well. Next. How we also um, give benefits to our DAO members is that verified holders, um, is any NFT holder of Wild Pixies can earn ETH through contributing our DAO. So we set up all of these different workstations um, and every three months, people can join different workstations to contribute. We track those contributions and then we reward those holders with Ethereum, right? So they can easily make back their money. Um, you can also get your experience minted as an NFT as part of your Web3 resume. You get access to community partner perks. We also do a thing where we can swap Pixies for um, items in the vault. So it prevents people from stocking up Pixies and dumping them. You can swap them for a, a large amount for, for different valuable items within our vault, tying the value of Pixies to, to the vault itself. Um, we also did a DAO created NFT collection where people voted in um, the artist to create our next collection, where if you own a Pixie, you can also mint the new collections NFT for free. Next. So um, this is an example of like proof of contribution. So once you, for example, if you are a marketing lead for a specific workstation, um, it can be proven by the co-founder or can be proven by uh, a member of the team that you actually contributed and it's verified by, by that project. And so now you can say, you know, not everybody wants to start their own project. So by building their own Web3 resume that's verified um, by your employer, right, or by the DAO, or by, um, by this project, you can start building out um, evidence that you've been contributing in the Web3 space and, and lead to new opportunities if you wanted to. Um, the second photo is an example of our kind of MVP of Pixies market, where people can swap their number of, or bid the number of Pixies that they want to swap for a specific NFT that we have in the in the vault. Yeah, next. Um, and so with the new collection that we're building, where everybody in the Wild Pixies DAO can mint for free, we're building out a, uh, we signed a contract with the Centraland and NAS Academy, where it's not just building a course, but you're actually building um, real world project experience, where by the time um, this is targeted towards non-technical people who want to actually experience and transition their career into Web3. And so um, the idea is that you can basically, by the end of the course, you will launch an official event with a brand on Decentraland. And when you finish, you do the demo day, Decentraland will verify you as an official consultant or official event organizer on um, their portal, on their job portal with your portfolio. Um, and recommend brands for you to organize metaverse events. You can also earn Pixie tokens for finishing the courses um, and also redeem mentoring time. And so subsequently, what we're also building is a Web3 mentor platform where you can, it's open to everybody, but if you, you can access, um, if you are a Pixie holder, you can access by earning tokens and uh, earning Pixie tokens um, through certain actions and redeem mentoring time, or you can just pay for mentor time if you're a non-holder. And so a lot of these mentors would be people like Randy Zuckerberg, who you normally may not have a chance to talk to in person. They can earn um, token in order, tokens in order to get a chance to speak with her um, or other, other kind of high profile mentors um, on the platform that you can have a chat, to, chat with. Awesome. So um, 
I know I went uh, over time because of all the technical difficulties and everything, but I will open a few minutes for questions. Awesome. Thank you so much, Lily. So there are some questions here. Um, the first question from Michael Yin. I am wondering how does Stripe make it easier for NFT to be monetized? Yeah, so I think um, at the moment, the main thing with NFTs is that there's a huge barrier of entry. The reason why is because typically in order to buy an NFT, you need to go on um, a marketplace like OpenSea, if it's an Ethereum NFT, or, um, you know, there's Magic Eden if it's a Solana NFT. These are NFTs housed on different blockchains. Um, and so there's a huge learning curve because you need to first go on to a, a um, kind of centralized exchange um, like Binance or Crypto.com um, and exchange your dollars for Ethereum. Then you need to set up a wallet and transfer your Ethereum to a MetaMask wallet or a digital you know, hot wallet, basically. And then you need to buy the NFT, right? So um, there's quite a number of steps in order to first get started first. And so um, part of what Stripe is doing as well is being able to use credit card to buy NFT to begin with so that you can kind of bypass the need to transfer into different coins in order to buy the NFT. Um, so that's just one of the ways. Can't say that where that's, completely live in APAC at the moment, but we do have a crypto team that is building out different functionalities for Web3. Um, awesome. Right, yeah. um, I think the next question has already been answered through your um, sharing session earlier. So let's just move on to Tanusha's question on, are NFTs a hype or do they have a sustainable future? What do you think? Yeah, so I guess um, hopefully you'll have Kind of gathered from this talk the the thing about nfts is that it can be anything that you want it to be as long as it represents a unique item um and so obviously you know right now and with any kind of new technology um you know even with the internet there was a huge bubble when that was first kind of created and people could exploit and make money out of it Likewise with NFTs, because it is tradable, um, as well as, you know, when you resell, you do get pe different people get percentage of income, you can resell it for higher kind of like Pokemon trading cards. Um, a lot of it is, you know, speculation as well. So I think it's important to differentiate the two. If you're there for the speculation, then, um, you know, then a lot of it is hype. But if you're there to then also build out what are the functionalities of NFTs, how can it be used in a lot of different use cases? Can it be used as a club? Can it be used for education? Can it be used for token gating? Can it be used to differentiate your consumer market and co-create things um, from brands and your customers and your loyal customers? Um, and if it was purely hype or a scam, then I don't think as many brands would be so interested in the use of NFTs. Not only that, you know, that's just one use case of NFTs with kind of the consumer side, but also NFTs can be used to track, you know, um, your supply chain, like, you know, which is this cow actually um, organic, right? Like, how do you verify that at the moment? So it can be down to very practical use cases with no, transactional value, um, but very high kind of importance um, in order to verify authenticity, or it can be used as something that is um, tradable, but actually now you can ascribe value to it digitally rather than um, just physical items. So is luxury goods a hype? Uh, art Is art a hype? Um, yeah, I would say so in, in some aspects. Um, and so now you can actually ascribe that kind of hype value also to digital items as well. So I think it really is about those two very different two things. Yeah. Awesome. Okay. The next question is, is there no restriction on things we can mint like selfies or anything else from the marketplace? 
Yeah, so um, when you're minting, uh, first things first, um, the marketplace is basically just a window to view your NFTs. Actually, the marketplace cannot actually control your NFTs um, and you don't mint it on a marketplace. You mint it on a smart contract, um, which can be viewed by a marketplace. So actually when you, when, for example, you buy and sell an NFT, um, it actually never goes past the, the, the marketplace actually through your wallet and they can reflect the information. Um, but yes, last year I did see the Indonesian mint his selfies. I mean, at the end of the day, you know, his selfies became a meme. Um, it became something to talk about. And so people decided to ascribe value to that. Um, I'd like to share an example, right? Like, you know, I talked about the Mona Lisa before. What people view as valuable is all based on like, you know, what, what actually makes the Mona Lisa worth, you know, close to a billion dollars, right? Is it the technical art? Is it the, um, is it because it's by Da Vinci? You know, why aren't his other artworks worth the same as the Mona Lisa? And the reason is because you know Mona Lisa was actually not that famous until 1910s and it was in the Louvre and the reason why it became famous was first of all it got stolen um from the Louvre and so it made, made national headlines but the thing that made it go viral was because people started actually memeing the Mona Lisa you know someone drew a mustache on the Mona Lisa someone wrote you know some kind of provocative stuff. And so that started spreading. And so now everybody knows what the Mona Lisa is, right? And so likewise, even though there's no kind of restriction on things that we can, can mint, some things are more valuable than others um, based on what collectively we view also as valuable. And at that time, the Indonesian who minted his selfies went viral. And so people thought that that was really funny. So they decided to buy it and that increased um, it's valuable because more and more people would would know about it. Great. Okay. So there are a couple of questions um, from Rajan Shahira and Dinesh, but I think that's something that you've already gone through in your um, presentation as well. So I think that's already answered. Let's just move on to Darren's question on how susceptible to fraud is the creation and sell a sale of an NFT. So um, something that I want to say is that the NFTs are extremely new technology, right? It's like less than five years old um, and it hasn't become you know, popular until less than a year ago. And so right now we are in such early stages that obviously there is, it is susceptible to a lot of fraud. Um, so anyone can basically take someone's artwork and mint their own collection. However, blockchain doesn't lie. So you can see that it was not, minted like by the actual artist itself. Um, so there is still a lot of infrastructure that needs to be built in order for um, NFTs to really become a legitimate thing that can verify um, and counter fraud as well. And a lot of things are being built, including identity measures. Um, how do you identify someone without having to reveal their kind of dot without having to dox them, but actually say, hey, this is the real person. Um, but in the future, NFTs is what can be used and will be used to actually counter fraud. Uh, but, the, but there's still some more things that need to be built in order for that to happen in the long term. Right, yep. Okay, the next question is, is it advisable for people to monetize their art using NFT as a side hustle? What do you think? Um, so what I'll say is that, you know, at the end of the day, still like 98% of NFTs probably have never had a sale. Um, the thing is that at, you still have to be able to build a really great community. You need to be able to be very good at marketing. Um, but if you can do those things and you already, you know, you want to actually um, monetize some of your art. It is a really great way because um, if you look at Instagram, there's so many talented artists with a hundred thousand followers, but they're selling their artworks, you know, as prints for ten dollars. But if they sold them as NFTs, not only can they 
um, create things like one of ones where there's only one of them. You can bid for it. People sell it for 30 ETH Ethereum, where it's, you know, 150,000, 200,000. Um, but it actually has some sort of NFTs makes it so that it's not just right click and save. Like you just download it from Instagram and you can feel like I own this artwork by this artist that I admire. Right. Not only that, because the artist gets the revenue um, every time that is resold, once again, it's another stream of recurring revenue and income for artists as well. Um, so I would say it's more around, you know, it's it doesn't bypass the fact that this is just a tool. You still need to do all of the hard work of creating the audience, marketing to your audience. But if you do already have that audience and um, you can build that that up, then this could be an extremely ludicrous, lucrative kind of income for artists to be sustainable and, you know, create art in their own terms. Yeah. Right. Got it. All right. Okay. The next question from Lisa is, hi, Lily. Thank you for taking the time to provide this information to us. I wanted to ask what might be the best source to find NFT, crypto, Web3 and Metaverse news? Uh, actually, this is a super hard question just because um, Web3 is so broad, but generally everything um, is who you follow on Twitter. Um, and so even if I'm very in kind of NFT space, I'm also in a niche of NFT, which is women projects within NFTs or like um, specific areas of the metaverse. Um, and so you know, it really depends on what you're interested in, what kind of use case you're interested in and starting from those use cases. Um, but that's why right now, you know, some good courses that I would recommend is the Curious Addies course built with NAS Academy um, around very basics around NFTs, cryptocurrency, as well as web development. If these are things that you're interested in. Um, but there are other Twitter kind of thought leaders like Zenica who writes good substacks um, around uh, NFTs. Um, I can't really say around more like DeFi or crypto, um, but also following people who who talk about different metaverses as well. Um, you can always find those official accounts like Decentraland, like Sandbox um, to NFT worlds to see who are those regular thought leaders that they they share etc as well okay awesome i hope that answers all of your questions um unfortunately we're going to have to wrap things up because we are a little bit over time but um lily if you don't mind could you just please drop in maybe your linkedin profile or any contact details that they um, that you have that they might want to reach out to yep. for further questions post the webinar session Okay, this is my LinkedIn. You can follow me. If you're already in the Web3 space, you can also follow me on Twitter, um, my project as well. And what else? Um, link. Yep, so you can just also. reach out and connect to Lily on her LinkedIn and Twitter. Um, and before we end today's session, I would just like to introduce all of you to the FWD Startup Studio Pre-Accelerator Program. As mentioned before, we are actually opening up applications for our fourth cohort this coming September. So if you have a startup or any idea in any one of these verticals that you would like to grow and develop, we welcome you to submit your application to this Pre-Accelerator Program. And through this program, you will be able to gain knowledge on product development, customer development, market development, as well as gain access to key industry leaders, funding and mentorship support. So you may either click on the link in the chat box or you can scan this QR code here if you are interested. And for your information, the top winners of the program will walk away with 150,000 in investments. Up next, we also have our regional InsurTech data hackathon from the 9th to the 11th of September. So do check out the insurance problem statements that we are trying to solve through our website. We are looking at team registrations. And if you are a coding expert, InsurTech and data enthusiast, or even an inspiring entrepreneur, we hope to receive your applications.
Right, so in our stream of events that we're coming up with FWD Startup Studio, we are having a launch your startup using design thinking on the 8th of September 2 to 5 p.m. So if you are interested, please RSVP to this session as well. Now, if you want to know on the overall Malaysia startup ecosystem and you would like to find out over on who is building what in the ecosystem, please head on to muruku.com, which is our one-stop platform for any startup-related data. And we will always be constantly updating this website as well. So do check it out. Right. So last but not least, I would like to thank all of you. And also, Lily, thank you so much for joining us in this session today. It's been very, very enlightening. And we really hope that this session was useful and valuable to you. So if you could please help us out by you know, filling in this quick feedback form so we can further improve our events in the future, that would be greatly appreciated. Um, thank you so much again for spending time with us today. And we look forward to seeing all of you in our future events. Take care. Bye.